We're still going through our, our series uh, from 2 Peter. So if you have your Bible, flip over to 2 Peter, still chapter 1. Um, and we've been talking about this Peter's prescriptive pathway. He's prescribing a pathway of discipleship and growth in Christ so each one of us become more like Christ. So um, uh, today, the one we're talking about, the next step is, is really interesting. We are living in a time like no other in history. We have so much information available to us at our fingertips in just a moment's notice. It used to be that if something happened, I mean, you think 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 100 or 200 years ago, if something happened, say, on the other side of the world, it would take days or maybe even weeks for anyone on, the, uh, you know, on another continent or another state or whatever to hear about it. Like when President Abraham Lincoln was shot, that news spread like wildfire, but still took two and three days sometimes for people to, under, for, to get the information that something had happened, right? Now we've got so much information, you want to try to fix your car. This is how I usually use it, right? You go to YouTube. If you don't know how to fix your car, there's somebody on YouTube who knows how to fix the car and has put out a video. There's probably 50 someones who have put out a video on how to fix that specific part in your specific car. It shows where it's at, shows the nuts and the bolts to loosen, shows the pieces to move out and back, shows you how to get it out, how much it should cost you, how long it should take, right? You want to learn how to bake a cake if you've never made a cake before. Not only can you read the instructions on the back of the box, but if you're making it from scratch, there's somebody on YouTube that knows what they're doing and has done it before. You want to learn how to do the new math? <laughs> there's somebody on YouTube that'll show you how to do new math. Right? That was the big thing for us with our kids growing up. Like, uh, give me five minutes. We ran away, watched a YouTube video. Okay, I think I understand. Right? We are living in an, in, a, in an age where there is so much information that is available to people. Um, but the problem is, uh, well, information is shared in, in, its, in, in every moment, and we're more connected to information in, in any other way. But, and people have more knowledge of stuff than ever before. Stuff. But not, of a, not all of us, and, and well, it, let me just stick with my notes. I'm going to go a hundred different ways if I don't do this. But, but people have a knowledge of more stuff, but the more we learn, the less we know. The more we learn, the less we know. But today we're going to go and unpack this next step in Peter's prescriptive process of growing in Christ. And our goal today is to understand what Peter is really talking about, but it's my prayer that every person would reflect on their own heart and their own walk with Jesus and be encouraged or maybe, maybe even confronted or, or challenged to take another step with him. So we're in 2 Peter chapter 1. Before we dig into scripture, let's just take an opportunity to pray. God, I thank you for who you are. God, you're awesome. You're amazing. You are holy and righteous and good. God, today we've gathered in this house and we've gathered online in this space to worship you, to honor you. This is worship, God. It's not just hearing, God. It's recognizing you. It's honoring you for who you are. And we want to grow in our knowledge and our understanding of you, God. We don't want to just know about you. We want to know you. And so, God, I pray that you challenge our hearts and our minds. Open our ears to hear today your voice. Open our minds to understand and our hearts to dare to believe. And we just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence to your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. Okay? So, Peter is unpacking this idea. God has given you so much. He's opened up heaven and his kingdom to people like you and like me. It doesn't matter what your history is. He's, he, his salvation gives every person a hope. It gives every person a future. It gives some, every person an opportunity to be and to grow and to um, have a connection with God that nobody's ever had before, right? And so he's saying... 
Because God has done all this for you, because heaven is now an opportunity, because now heaven is an option, and you've just decided to be faithful to God, you need to make every effort to supply to this faith, to build your faith through moral excellence, which is the first step we talked about last week. If you, if you missed it, you can check it on, on YouTube. If you're joining us on YouTube, then it's like literally right in the playlist right next to this. Um, and this week we're talking about knowledge, okay? So it's Peter's prescriptive process starts with a pro, making a choice to be faithful and then bringing in God's morality, learning to walk with excellence, and then we're asked to add to this lifestyle a knowledge of who God is. Now, this seems a little backwards. I want you to choose to be faithful first, and then I want you to walk in God's excellence. Oh, and third step, maybe you should get to know him. Right? I want you to get into a relationship with them. Second step, third step, maybe you should get to know the guy. It seems a little backwards, but it's not. It's not. Um, it seems like getting to know, know God should be like the first step in the whole process, maybe even before choosing to be faithful. Now, the idea of knowing a God isn't new to Peter, even in this time. Uh, 200 B.C., there was a group formed called the Gnostics, and it was a religious movement, and their thought process was if they could understand some secret personal knowledge of a God, that was how they were saved. The world was going to hell. The world is going south really fast. Morally, ethically, it's just the whole world is on fire. It's kind of like they, the Gnostics saw the world and saw it's a waste. The only way out is for us to awaken some kind of inner spark in ourselves. And the way you did that was to have a head knowledge an understanding of some super secret special knowledge of a God, one of the gods. You pick your God, and as long as you can get some super secret special personal knowledge for yourself, you could awaken that inner spark, and when you die, then there's paradise. That was their thought process. And you could lay Gnosticism, that's how they called themselves, you could lay that Gnostic ideology over any God any of the Roman gods, any of the Greek gods, any of the pagan gods that we talk about from like Old Testament scripture, and even people in Jewish culture. Now, this is actually the word that Paul uses. He says, learn knowledge, gain knowledge, Gnosticism, right? But Paul is, or not Paul, Peter, Peter is using it in a different way, okay? He's referring to this, but that's not what he's prescribing. Peter's advocating knowing God instead of just knowing about him. Hold on. Time out. Knowing God, not just knowing about him. There is a big difference. There's a huge difference, right? Peter's advocating the kind of knowledge that comes out of close and intimate connection of the heart, not just a connection of the head. Okay? We've already said it. We have more information in this world today than ever before. If you want to know about Michael Jordan, you could get on the internet or buy books or whatever like this and read. Uh, heck, Netflix even had a video about him or a movie, uh, a whole series about him. It's like a little mini series about the life of Michael Jordan, right? ESPN has done things about the life of Michael Jordan. If you want to learn about Michael Jordan, you could learn about Michael Jordan, but there is a difference in knowing about Michael Jordan and knowing him personally. Big difference. Big, huge difference. Right? I could know Michael Jordan and be able to identify him in a crowd and say, oh, that's Michael Jordan. He wouldn't know me. He wouldn't know me in the slightest. But what Peter, with the right name, what Peter is advocating for people, for Christians to do, the Christians who are reading his letter, is start with faith, add moral excellence, and then of that, start to gain a close and intimate and a personal knowledge of God for yourself. Be his best friend. Make him your best friend. I've seen shirts uh, at some point in time that says I'm God's favorite and everybody was wearing them 
it's really the truth. God loves you that much. You are God's favorite. If you're watching online, you are God's favorite. And believe it or not, he is pursuing you. We'll get to all of that. And he loves you that much. So what I want to do with the rest of our time here is give you four reasons why you need to, this, this kind of knowledge, this intimate heart connection needs to be a part of every Christian's life. And I want to wrap it up in the end about how you do that. So I'm going to give you four reasons why you should be adding this to your life and one reason of how, or one way of how, okay? First, first why. This, is the, uh, this kind of knowledge opens a pathway of communication. There's a couple of things every person knows. You know your name. And you know when people call your name, you are going to look for the person who's calling your name. Um, several of us have names or nicknames or titles or things like this, but you know what people call you. I remember there's, there were a couple of times, uh, as, especially in youth ministry, what we'd do is we'd go out and we'd uh, take kids to Kings Island or Cedar Point or something like this, and we, we made them at least have a buddy system, but a lot of times kids were just going everywhere, all over the place. And there were times when I'd be walking through with a couple of people of my own, just kind of, we were hanging out at the, at the amusement parks, and then all of a sudden I would hear a voice that I recognized call one of my titles or my name. And you know what I would do? I'd start looking around. I might be in line for a ride. I might be in line for a churro or something like this. I don't know. I just, like, all of a sudden I hear one of my names or one of my titles, and I'd start looking. And I would look until I found that name, and generally what would happen is I'd, I'd look all around, and I don't see them. And then you get some student waving at me, right, so I can lock in. But I know the voice. And I know my name because there's a knowledge and a connection and a relationship with the person. And when we know God in this way, it opens up a line of communication. Um, we have to wrap our minds around this. Jesus is calling your name whether you realize it or not. Every day, he's talking to you. Every day, without exception. Whether you are part of the family of God or even if you're not. Let me just make this clear to you. Even if you're not a Christian, God is calling your name in the hopes that you recognize Him. And when you are a Christian, God is calling your name because He's your best friend. And He wants to be your best friend. And when we come into the family of God and when we have that faith and we gain that knowledge of who He is... All of a sudden, we start to hear the voice because we recognize the man. Because we recognize the person. I've been in crowded rooms before, and I hear, Dad! But I don't know the voice, so I don't turn around. Right? When my son calls Dad, I know his voice, and I start looking specifically for my son. It's the relationship, it's the knowledge that we have of each other that causes the lines of communication to be open between me and my son. It's the same thing with God. The more you know of him, this intimate heart connection, the more you know of God, the more that line of communication comes open. We pray all the time. How many of us listen for the voice? Come on. Jesus knows your voice. And when you pray to Him and to God the Father, they, God listens because He knows your voice. Because He has a knowledge of you that you may not even have of yourself. There's an open line of communication to the throne. But unless we have that knowledge of who God is, unless we have that closeness, there's a lot of times that line of communication in, and towards us has been cut off. Knowledge of God opens up that pathway for communication. John chapter 10, verse 27 says, Jesus himself said this, My sheep, listen to my voice. 
I know them, same word, know them, and they follow me. That term follow means more than just to walk behind. The term actually means to be inseparable from the other. There's actually, it's a, it's a broader definition than that. It's a larger definition, but just to, for the simplicity of it all, right? So Jesus is talking about shepherd and sheep. And he says, the shepherd calls them, the sheep follow, but that follow, the sheep are inseparable from the shepherd. You can't pull them away. You can pull them away, but when you let them go, guess what they do? They run right back to the shepherd. Because there's a relationship there. There's a trust. There's a friendship. The sheep knows the shepherd, and they are inseparable from him. They hear, they hear his voice. How many of you have ever, I mean, I've heard it all, all over the place, but how many of you have ever, like, thought, how do I hear the voice of God? Get to know him. Really, it's, it really is that simple, but it's, it takes more time and more investment than, than you know, there, there's a process of getting to know him. Just like there's a process of getting to know anyone. Having that heart-to-heart -heart relationship opens up the lines of communication to his people. There are lots of Christians who want to know that they're hearing God, and what I believe is happening is they're wanting to follow God, but right now they're following the shepherd at a distance. There are things that could separate the sheep from the shepherd. But the closer we get, the closer we get relationally, the closer we get emotionally, the closer we get spiritually to the shepherd, I guarantee you, the more you'll hear his voice. The more you'll hear his voice. Okay? Second, why? The pursuit of this kind of knowledge begins a process of transformation at the heart level. Look, the process starts with a choice to be faithful, and it continues with a choice to walk in moral uh, excellence, right? We talked about that last week. You can be faithful by a choice of your will. You can force yourself, well, I know I should do this and I shouldn't be doing this. And so, God, I'm choosing you and I want heaven and I want to be part of, 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 of heaven and your kingdom and everything else, so I'm going to force myself to be faithful to you. Okay, God, you've said that this is right and this is wrong. Well, I'm going to force myself, even though I want to do these things, by an act of my will, I am going to force myself to walk in moral excellence. Right? You can do those as an act of your will, but when it comes to getting really close, I'm talking heart-to-heart -heart closeness, people change. When you're talking about intimate relationships all of a sudden, people start to transform. My wife and I were different when we first got married. And she would tell people this, so I'm not saying anything that she wouldn't already say. But when we got married, I was really, really mellow. Like, I was laid back. Like, I, like man, my, my attitude was like backyard in a hammock with a Coke in a straw, right? Maybe a little umbrella in there. It's like, man, everything's good. Just, just relax. You know, it'll be fine. It got to the point, like, okay, I'll just tell you a story. Like, this was the kind of influence I had on my family, right? Darby and Peyton would fight all the time when they were younger. My two kids, my, my daughter, Darby, and my son, Peyton, they would fight all the time over everything, right? And every time I'd walk into the room, every time they're having an argument, I would stop and say, hey, does it matter? And they'd, uh, mm, uh, but, but, does it matter? No, uh, no, right? Because that's the attitude I had. And eventually, it got to the point where I, heard, I overheard this. Darby and Peyton are yelling at each other, and then Darby yells at Peyton, Peyton, does it matter? <laughs> right? I rubbed off on them because we were close. My wife and I, we were totally different. She's a little more naturally high strung. I mean, I don't know what the word is, is there, but she's, she's a little bit more e emotional. Let's put it that way. And I'm laid back. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm really not trying to paint you in a bad light, right? She got angry at things a lot easier than I did, right? And now she's more laid back 
and I'm a little bit more on edge. I'm not sure that's a good trait, but we've rubbed off on each other because the closeness begins a transformation of who I am. Look, it's like a candle and a flame. You ever like, I mean, just think about it. a candle, a pillar candle is what's in my mind, right? You light the flame on the top, and it begins to transform the way that candle looks. The candle's still functioning, but the wax is running down the side. And at the end of it, that entire, when that candle is, has, been, has been totally spent by the, the fire, changes the candle. Your relationship with God, you're the candle, He is the flame. And so the closer you get to him, the more you start to reflect the nature of God. And God shapes you to be exactly what he wants you to turn into, to become. You realize that when you burn a candle, you can burn five candles. You can burn a hundred candles and burn them all the way down. Not one candle looks like the other candle. But they all look like they've been impacted by the flame. That's the same thing with all of us. When you walk with Christ... Your life turns out differently and looks differently than mine. Because God's got plans for your life. God's got intentions for your life. God's got intentions for who who he wants you to become that is different for every single person. Right? But the more you get close to Christ, the more you get close to God, the more your life is transformed and impacted. You may choose Jesus as an act of your will. You may choose faithfulness as an act of your will. You may choose to let God draw the, the, the line between right and wrong by an act of your will. But when you start to add this intimate intertwining of souls with God, your life becomes transformed. And you know what? Faithfulness is no longer needing to be an act of your mind or your will. You just find yourself conforming. Goodness no longer becomes a forced action. You find yourself being changed. Right? So this, it's, a, it's a knowledge that it's not just about communication, but it also changes our life. Now, we see this all the way through the Scripture. Just think about this. Moses got close to the holiness of God in Exodus chapter 3, and it started him on a pathway of transformation. Moses at the end of Deuteronomy is not the same Moses of Exodus 3. He's not. Um, I, I got a few other examples here. Isaiah, when he got close to the holiness of God, realized how sinful he was and was forever changed, Isaiah 6. The first time Peter got close enough to Jesus to understand who he was, he told Jesus to go away because he himself was full of sin. But seeing this started a a process of transformation transformation in Peter. Paul saw the glory of God. He was on his way to kill a bunch of people of the way, Christians. Came face to face with the glory of God, and three days later, everything about his life was changed. Right? Right? John, after living in his entire life as walk, you know, John was transformed by the presence of Jesus and the relationship that John had with Jesus. But then you get to the book of Revelation and he actually sees the fullness of the glory of God and he's like, he's realizing how much more he needs to be transformed. He falls on his face and, 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 and like a dead man and says, woe is me, you know? Um, and so there's a, Every time, the closer you get to God, there begins a process of transformation in your heart and in your life and in yourself because there is this intimacy, because there is this closeness, we are transformed, Scripture says, from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. I'm adding more glories, right? But there's a transformation that begins to take place because you've chosen to get close to God. Third why. Intimacy with God makes it possible to walk in complete moral excellence. Now, I've, I've hinted at this already, but let's take this a little bit deeper. Getting to know someone at a heart level unlocks the mysteries of their heart. Getting to know somebody so well that you can finish their thoughts Married couples end up doing this all the time. 
my wife will call me and says, don't forget. I'm like, I know, I know. Anybody else? It unlocks the mysteries of their heart, right? Walking in moral excellence isn't just about doing what's right and wrong, but living life in a way that makes God proud of you. Oh God, I did what you said, and I, I did right, and I, I, I didn't step over the line, God. There's a big difference between that and says, but God, everything I do with my life, I just want to make you proud of me. I want to make you smile. God, I, want, I, I don't want to offend you. This relationship that we have, the knowledge that I have of you and the knowledge that you have of me, I don't ever want to come at a, to a point of watching it be broken apart. So God, I want to unlock the mystery of your heart. And I want to please your heart, not just your law. We understand the, the difference there? So God's reveal, revealed himself in a lot of different ways, and we can walk in moral excellence in all the ways he's revealed himself. But when we walk in intimate relationship with God, we know you begin to know what God's heart is for you as an individual. God's heart for you and the things that he wants for you may be different than what God wants for me. What's right for others may not be right for you. Right? I'll use the illustration of myself again. And this, I was challenged by this just as I was writing this the other day. Um, everybody, most everybody has a cell phone. And the younger you are, the more games you have on your phone. And I was finding myself to have quite a collection of, of games on my cell phone. The problem is, is, I really like playing games. Games distract me, though. I spend more time on the games than I do on other things. And... A while ago, I just felt like God was telling me, get rid of the games off your phone. It's a distraction to you. It, they're coming between us, right? This relationship. There's something in between. Now, there's nothing wrong with having games on your phone. There's nothing wrong with playing games on your phone. There's nothing sinful about it. But you know what? It was causing distance between me and God. And at the time, I deleted everything. But guess what happens over time? Oh, yeah, yeah, I had about six games on my phone. Yesterday was, I'm, or the other day as I'm typing this up, I'm just realizing, and like God brought it back. I told you to get rid of the games off the phone. Okay. So I deleted them all. See, what's right for me isn't necessarily because it's wrong, but it hurts my relationship with God because my focus isn't on us together, there's something that's come between us. And my focus is getting eaten up by something. And for me, that's the right thing to do. But I only know that because of my relationship with God. The lines of communication have been opened. My life is beginning a process of transformation. And God says, but this isn't good for you. Right? So when we have this intimate knowledge, this intimate connection with God, we can walk in complete moral excellence. Does that make sense? Okay. Fourth why. It's more than just a heart connection. It's a guardrail for faithfulness. There are byproducts about adding this kind of knowledge. When you when you have an intimate relationship, when you have an intimate connection with someone, anyone, you realize you start to care about them more? Most of you could care less about someone like the starting quarterback for the Tennessee Titans. I don't even know who that is, to be honest. Right? But most of you, all of you, most all of you care for your siblings, your parents, your kids, right? 
because there's more of a connection. I mean, that's a really terrible and basic example, but there's more of a connection. When you have that connection, it causes you to care about someone a whole lot more. And, <coughs> excuse me, and there's a desire to stay connection, connected. Intimate knowledge is more than just relational knowledge. It's an intertwining of your heart with the very presence in the Spirit of God. All of a sudden, faithfulness to God becomes faithfulness to a relationship. Faithfulness to God means being faithful to your best friend. And it's not a challenge. It's not a challenge. All of a sudden, when you're tempted to do something that's outside of the bounds of the relationship, it's like, no, why would I even want to do that? I am not tempted in the slightest to offend or to stress or to strain my relationship with my wife. It's just not. I have no, there's no desire in my heart to do that. Why? Because we become so knit together. If I were to offend her, it hurts me. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you offend your best friend, whoever that might be, you hurt yourself. And so this knowledge, this closeness, this intimacy, this relationship with God becomes guardrails for faithfulness. Why would I not want to spend time with him? Because when I don't spend time with him, it hurts me. It hurts me. Why would I want to hurt myself? So those are our four whys, right? It, begins a, it, it opens the lines of communication. It begins a process of transformation. It, uh, it, it allows us to walk in pure goodness, like the real goodness, and it, it is a guardrail for our faithfulness. So the, the only question left to answer is the how. How do we do this? How do we add this connection of heart? You do this by seeking God out. See, God's not hard to find, and he's already pursuing you. He's not hard to find. He's already in pursuit of you. He's calling your name all the time, whether you want to hear it or not. I've heard it called this way, that, that a, relationship, a Christian's relationship with God is this giant game of, of, of God tag. You pursue God, and you tag him. And then he will pursue you and tag you back. And you, you, you pursue him, he pursues you. You pursue him, he pursues you. And before you know it, many of us in this room, and I don't know how many of you out on YouTube land, uh, know what it's like to pursue a relationship with someone. Several of us have been married, and there had to be a pursuit of that relationship. You may have known about them. You may have even had a basic relationship, but until someone takes the step and the steps out and starts the pursuit, nothing changes. How do you get close to God? You need to pursue Him. You need to pursue Him, right? Look, we pursue God the same way we pursue anyone else. Time and effort. Time and effort. Before I got married I, uh, to my wife, I had to pursue her. I bought plane tickets. I spent weeks in Utah. I wrote letters every Monday and mailed them out every Tuesday. Every week. She still got them all. I don't know why. One of these days, I'll probably, we'll probably end up using them to start a fire or something. I don't even know. <coughs> but for three years, almost three years, two and a half, I wrote a letter every Monday and mailed it out every Tuesday. Every Friday at 10 p.m. Eastern time, no, 10 p.m. Mountain time, I was in Eastern time, which is midnight for me, I would call her on the phone. It takes time. It takes effort. Sometimes it takes a little money. But how would you pursue anyone? You want to get to know someone? You put yourself in their space. 
You make sure they see you. That You make sure they recognize you. You start a friendship. You start talking. You start connecting. You start getting together. And before you know it, it's like, wow, this is my best friend that I didn't, didn't even know about until, what, three months ago? My wife and I have known each other since nine years old. We've known of each other since nine years old. We became best friends in high school because of this process of pursuit. I pursued her, and guess what? She pursued me back. That was great. <laughs> you get it, though. It takes time. It takes effort to pursue people, right? Look, look at all these ways you pursue God through. By maintaining a posture of prayer. Like, yeah, everybody talks about you know who God is or you get close to God through prayer. Yeah, prayer. But Paul says, pray constantly, pray consistently, pray forever, pray all the time, pray when you get up, pray when you, uh, Deuteronomy talks about, talk about God, think about God, when you walk, when you get up, when you lay down, when you walk along the road, talk about him, those kinds of things. That's an attitude and a posture of prayer. Do you ever go an entire day without thinking about your best friend? Come on. Let's just be honest. Then why do we only think about God when we pray? Because we're not in that place of pursuit. Okay? Um, not a uh, second thing, not just reading the words of the Bible, but looking for God's heart through the words of the Scripture. I know people that have read the Bible cover to cover and they're not changed because they don't have a connection with God. But when I open the Scripture, I'm like, God, show me your heart today. I want to know who you are. You, this is your love letter to me. You've revealed yourself to me through the scriptures, and I want to see you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know your heart. I want to go closer to you. So as I'm reading scripture, I'm thinking about the words of whomever is writing. I'm thinking about their audience, but I'm also listening and, and looking for the heart of the Father because it's in there. It's in there. And the more I learn of who God is, more than just the words of the page, the more I learn who God is, the more I pursue him and the more I grow in him. Excuse me. Uh, third thing, thinking about scripture. Right? We call, sometimes we call this meditation. You ever read a passage in scripture that just sticks in your head and you end up thinking about it for a while? That's really all it is. I, I used to tell students... Uh, as a, in a discipling process with them, they're like, I've been reading scripture and everything else, and every, you know, I've, I've been reading scripture. I mean, how do I know how far to read, what to read, how long to read? And we, we set them up on, on plans and stuff. But I always tell them, read until something sticks out to you. Read it until something sticks out to you. And when that sticks on, out to you, think about it. Talk to someone else about it. Because you know what that does? That that starts to impact your pursuit of him. It starts to grow, in, you start to grow in the knowledge of who he is. Uh, meditation on who you've already recognized God to be. Mo you know what, most of the Psalms that David wrote are just songs about who he's already recognized God to be. God, you are my rock. God, you are my banner. God, you are my defender. God, you are the great I am. And he's just reflecting on who, how many of you just stop and think about who God is? Who, who he's, not just who he is, but who you've seen him to be. Everybody else has got a different definition of who God might be, right? And to you, he might be something, and to me, he might be something different. But what we need to do is reflect on how God has revealed himself to you. Is he your healer? I don't have a story of personal healing in my life. But some of you may. God touched me, and all of a sudden, this was, Doc says it couldn't be fixed, and it's fixed. God has revealed himself as a healer, and what we need to do sometimes is think about and meditate on who God has already revealed himself to be. I know I'm taking too long. Uh, fifth thing. We did it this morning a little bit. Taking time to praise. That might be a song. That might be a prayer. That might be a shout. That might be a, a dance. I don't even know. They're bringing the Ark of the Covenant from out of town and into Jerusalem, and David is struck with just the awesomeness and the majesty of God. He starts dancing. Now, he takes all his clothes off to do it, but, which I wouldn't recommend anyone do, but, um, you know, it struck him that way. 
Because he's praising. He's praising God. I remember that there have been times in my, in my life where I find myself just overwhelmed with the presence of God. I end up shutting the door to my office or shutting the door to wherever I am and just singing and crying and praising God because of who he is. Something strikes me in the moment. I'm reminded of the greatness of God. And so I end up, there's, there's a natural praise that comes out. And when I praise, like, it's crazy. When I really connect with God and when I start really praising, there's, I usually cry. I don't know why, but that's, I guess that's just the way it impacts me a little bit, right? And it's not unmanly. It's just my expression of, of, of love and affection and joy. And, and you, know, you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's just this, I am so in love with God, that's how it expresses itself. Right? Right? Some people are dancers, some people are shouters, I'm a crier. Okay, get it, and, you know, that's me, that's who I am, that's how God created me to be, and that's the way it works, right? And so if you're a crier, I, I identify with you, okay? Anyhow, so meditating on God, taking time to praise, last one, it causes you to put God in the forefront of your thought process. If anything that you do causes you to put God in the forefront of your thought process, it's technically taking time to pursue him. You read a bumper sticker that says praise God and it makes, puts God in the forefront of your mind and you sit and you meditate on who God is, it's the pursuit of God because of a bumper sticker. Or what really is kind of uh, like a favorite of Jody and I or whatever. Well, I don't know about a favorite, but we see it more and more often, it seems like. We see something on Facebook or we see something that we totally disagree with on social media and it put God in the forefront of our mind and we end up talking and discussing the things about who we realize God to be and recognize God to be. And you know what? It actually causes us to be closer to God. Not that I'm looking at all y'all's Facebooks and looking for things to, you know, to nitpick and things like that. That's not the point. Just when we see them, it puts it in the forefront of our mind. And it causes us to pursue God more. Right? So, I, these are just some ideas. These are just some excuses, or not excuses, but these are just some examples. That's the word I was looking for, examples. But you need to pursue God for yourself. You need to let your soul intermingle with the presence of God. You and God need to become more of one. Okay? So those are the hows, those are the whys. Let me just wrap this up. This is the kind of knowledge that God has of you already. This is the kind of knowledge that Jesus died for. This is the kind of relationship that Jesus died for. He didn't die for you to just become a number in the kingdom. Just another mark on the census. Jesus died so that you could have intimate knowledge and intimate connection with the God of all the universe. Choose to be faithful. Begin to walk in his goodness and his, uh, his, his ideas of right and wrong and his morality. But then add to that a pursuit of the person of God. And it'll change your life. It'll change your life. See, before Jesus died, no one had the ability to get close. No one had the ability to get close. You had to take an animal to the priest, and the priest got close for you. But now, the door is flung wide open. And Jesus has his arms stretched out, ready to bear hug you. And you have access to the presence of the Father if you just pursue him.